time you've owned a car. From from what I've gathered, you've only ever owned about three. <laughs> one. One. <laughs> Literally, I've never one. <laughs> so it's actually the longest I've owned a dick. Welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 20. Fanfare, fireworks, symbol, percussion. What an amazing achievement to have wasted 20-something hours of your time. We're sorry, but we're carrying on. To start with, this week, Formula One versus the Indy 500. Two of the greatest motorsport spectacles on the planet happen at the same weekend. And I think there was a clear winner. But what does... Neil Clifford think. Well, I enjoyed both. I mean, let's let's kick this off with a bit of optimism. It was it, it was it was they were both good, weren't they? And I was eventually I was, they were sandwiched between trying to watch the end of the Premier League as well for me. So I missed the start of Indy. But to be honest, the best thing about that weekend was the quality. You know, the cars are too bloody big to race around that fucking circuit, aren't they? It's like watching bumper cars. But the quality. I have to admit that Max is just brilliant, right? You know, he was, he, there's no way I thought he was going to get back in that sector three. And he did. But and it, it was like an out of body experience. It was like watching Senna in, Manish will tell me the day, but uh, 93 or whenever it was, that sort of genius lap or the Donington thing. It was one of those laps that, or, or quality sessions that will go down in history, I think, won't it? Um, I, I still feel does. sorry. For, I still feel sorry for Ferrari. They've got two. They got the. They got wrong drivers, haven't they? Not good enough. Keep making mistakes. Did you see the over? Did you see the overlay of uh, Alonso I and did. Verstappen's? Yeah. Um, it was really, really interesting to watch. Yeah. Raskas, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, amazing, amazing. And you could see it, couldn't you? Not as if I'm technically brilliant, as we know, on on going around tracks, but you could see that that last sector, those last couple of corners, he was just on the absolute beyond the limit, probably. He was on 110, but, wasn't he? But Alonso was well ahead of him in the first two sections. Yeah. 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 So I think I think the race was a bit tricky. I know Bernie pressed the rain button, didn't he, from from up in heaven to make it a bit more interesting at the end. Um, I know he's not dead, obviously, but but he pressed it from somewhere that um, meant that we stayed engaged for the last third of the race. And good on Alonso, good on Lewis. I thought there was a lot of good driving. You guys will tell me more of the technical elements of that. But I enjoyed both. I'll let Chris talk about Indy 500. But God, there's a lot of crashes and they go really fast. And aren't the cars ugly? <laughs> right, Chris Quite Cooper. Ugly. Chris Cooper, pick up those bits and make something of them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Monaco showed us that. Races that start dry and go wet are much more interesting than races that start wet and are wet the whole way through or just dry out because you never quite know when. And particularly in that track, in those conditions, when they did, and, you know, poor old George, must he literally was kicking himself. He had a nailed-on podium there um, and just got distracted by Lance disappearing up the escape road at Mirabeau or the Rosberg Road, as we should call it, after that incident a few years ago. Um, qualifying was amazing. I mean, it does show, I mean, we said it when we were talking about Miami and the fuss of all the Rasmataz. They are gladiators. They are absolute heroes. There was a couple of interviews I saw on social media with Lando when he was trying to explain to people, and he just gave up and said, I can't explain. I, there's nothing I can do to tell you how extraordinarily difficult that is mm -hmm. and how much you're concentrating. And, and you know, we said this before, you know, monkey, neither, neither you or I are, are in their class. We might like to think on our day of days, we were pretty bloody impressive. And we know, I mean, I, I think you and I both same. I love driving in the wet. I always love driving in the wet because everybody finds it slightly nerve wracking and all, oh, I can't go too fast. There's, there's a quite technical, I won't go into it now, but there's quite technical reasons why if you push the car too much in the dry, the mu, the coefficient of friction, of the surface, allow, bring the car back. In the wet, even when it's quite damp, when the, it's like skimming a stone. The tyre lifts off the track and just skims on that bit of moisture, and it takes forever. Like a skimming stone looks like it. Why is it still on the surface of the water when it's going quite slowly? Driving in the wet's like that. If you lose it in the wet, you've lost it. You're never going to get it back. So those guys are just heroes. Um, the race was pretty dull. I mean, I was, as you could probably tell, from my, I was actually sailing on Sunday <laughs> afternoon. So I was following the race from comments from my colleagues, and I could tell it was quite dull. 
until it started to rain. And then we just saw heroes. And it was a, did Aston Martin cock it up a bit? I don't know, with their, their strategy. But yeah, amazing. Alonso, I think I sent to you guys, there's a picture somewhere on social media I've seen of the podium. <clears throat> and Fernando allows the team manager of Red Bull to share his podium in the third spot. So he's forced a little bit towards podium. So probably innocuously, he had one foot on mm. the top step of the podium. And I thought, that's just brilliant. Uh, so I, I really, Fernando is driving. He's the driver of the season for me so far. Just this little interview I saw with him and, and Max talking about flowers and gardening. And you just think he's a different person. Maybe it comes to all of us. Monkey, even you, when we all grow up, will become happy and smiley and so forth. India was amazing. Um, I mean, we all kept our fingers crossed when that wheel disappeared into oh my, the crowd. Oh, my God. Crikey. What happened? Is there, uh, is there it some... was... Uh, well, I mean, what happened to the wheel? I saw the incident. But uh, I didn't it, know. Cleared, oh. it cleared the grandstand. Actually, so, by the look yeah, of it. Was, I mean, I've, didn't I've I see that race. it hit someone's car? And it they, did. They, oh. they, they basically dragged her in and they fixed her car for her. Yeah. I mean, it didn't. I, I thought the car would have been flat. There's a lot of energy in a flying wheel. Uh, I've been at the racing circuit and racing in an event where wheels come off, I can't go on into the crowd and it doesn't end well. It's really, really horrible. So I think it was, but it just showed that you kind of got to watch a whole race because it's a bit like a mini series. You kind of, if you don't even watch the last lap, you think, wow, it's amazing. If you watch the whole race and see the build up and people's fortunes change and ever flow in that race, it's such a race for doing that. And on that last, that one lap green flag, just Amazing. unbelievable. And um, Marcus Ericsson driving almost in, or is it the, um, uh, the guy who won? Joseph Neugarten. Neugarten, who'd been trying for 13 years. On that last lap, basically driving into the pit road to try and break the toe. I mean, we've all seen that. So, yeah, so I think... Are you allowed to do that? Um, I suspect it wouldn't be recommended again. Because you got looked very close to that, hairy. that divider. I think and you, if you the just great gone, thing about that race is you can kind of do what you want. It looks like yeah, you can. Quite, so, I quite like that. So I think Monaco will always be part of F1. Uh, if it rains later in the race, same thing happened in 96, I think, uh, when... Panis. Um, Panis won. won uh, unfancied way. Um, Damon chucked it off amongst a whole bunch of others. Uh, so I think F1 survived Monaco, particularly because it was wet. The first bit of the race was rubbish. Mm -hmm. Qualifying was great. Indy was, it's always fantastic. And the cars do look a bit shit, but it doesn't spoil that unbelievable spectacle. Um, so, yeah, I thought both were really, really great in the end. Um, and we're just so glad that everyone walked away from both of those intact. But, yeah, it was a mega weekend for both of those disciplines. I would love it. Thoughts? I think you, you lot are far um, better to um, comment on this. But uh, for me, it's Formula One. Just add rain. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah it makes all yeah. the difference. And that, like, oh, oh, you, you guys are going to talk about Ocon, I'm sure, but you know, the, the, the standard of the driving was exceptional this weekend. You know, there was obviously a little bit of twatting of the barriers at one, one, one point, but it, it, you know, they, they all drove so well considering the conditions, mm. the sizes of the car. It was very, it was very impressive to watch. It, it, it reminds me, I, I shared this car. I mean, my monkey made this point yesterday. They're, and I said it earlier, they are all heroes and gladiators. So it's quite hard for us to sound negative about any of them because we'd just be off and just seeing how slippery it was when they first went on to Winters. But the Autosport magazine driver rating, um, they described Perez's weekend as one of pure putrefaction, which I think I've never heard that word used. Oh, I'm not in, in, in a driving I, I just, context. It's not fair. You can sit in your armchair and you can say exactly for a bad yeah. weekend. But I, I thought it was it was harsh when you've um, been White City karting twice in your life. Fuck off! Right <laughs> off you go, Manish. Please. Oh gosh, um, you sent a little WhatsApp, which I really reflected on um, all yesterday evening. You were talking about the fact that. Had Max Verstappen been driving 30 years ago or 25 years ago, the number of little kisses he had with barriers would probably have ended his race several times. And I, I, I really thought about that. Like for me, the drivers of, um, 
of this race were actually um, Alonso and Ocon. And what Alonso showed for me is what I would call a Senna-like precision. He wasn't overdriving the car. I think Max maybe, you know, may maybe he got he did get a little bit lucky because he was clouting those things all the time. And if you did watch that fantastic overlay of Alonso versus Max Verstappen, I know Max really pulled it out in the third sector, but by definition, Alonso pulled it out in sectors one and two in an Aston Martin in its first competitive year. And I, I, his driving for me this year is an absolute revelation. If you read Alonso's own criticisms of his own driving historically, what he says is he's as good as anyone in the race. You know, he's like Senna in the race. He's like Schumacher in the race. But what he said is that the, the chink in his armor has always been one lap qualifying. That's always been for him, the little chink in his armor. And I think the lap he put together was just, it, it was just sort of inch perfect. It made me think, I've been thinking Max's acrobatics are quite Senna-like in a way. But for me, the lack of precision, I mean, a guy doesn't win Monaco six times in 10 races. He was on the podium twice more. I'm talking about Senna now. Should have won actually a seventh, but you know he threw it away in 1988. If he isn't anything other than utterly precise. And for me, Max is actually Mansell. He's not Senna. He's Mansell. He's that guy with 31 wins and 31 crashes. What you see is the absolute limit, and he does veer over the top. And um, I mean, the, the other thing I would say about this race was um, I was wondering whether um, Perez was paid to crash the car. So that because this is one of those few circuits where a crane lifts you up and everyone can see the underside. Mm -hmm. And so now everyone's copying the wrong underside in Formula One. They're all shooting away. And Adrian Hughes going, see, <laughs> occasionally you have to give one away to win the whole season. So next week, OK, watch the... Uh, well, or the ne next iteration of these cars, I mean, watch them all suddenly losing loads of time and not being able to work out why. <laughs> yes. Having copied the Red Bull. That's a it's good very job. very Formula One to do that. One of the few circuits we've got very high cranes. You're not just going to get wheeled off by... I feel, um, feel duty-bound to defend our noise after the suggestion he had as many crashes as... And his crashes were spectacular. Have you, not my have phrase. You met, 31 like... crashes, 31... Race he's victories. quite a big bloke, Manish. But apparently he's very sedate now. I'm just strong, saying. <laughs> strong boy. Yeah. Um, I think I love the idea that they've that they've deliberately given Perez's car a hooky on the floor. So I love that. That's <laughs> yes, so yes. Formula One. That reminds me of when I discovered when we were researching the Lotus 79 to do a film on Top Gear, and they were trying to hide the ground effect. And Colin Chapman decided that he could dupe the rest of the teams by keeping the skirts up, and they'd all think it was a special diff he'd fitted. So after every session, he'd have someone scuttle out the back of the garage, carrying something that was diff-shaped underneath a towel. And it turned out it was a massive um, uh, teapot. It was just a teapot under a towel, and everyone thought it was a diff. And this, and this one mechanic who's still alive was charged, right, there's your teapot, put the towel over it, scuttle over there looking guilty. And that's what his job was. Wow. Uh, so I do. You I, know, I, you know, Gordon Murray did exactly the same thing with his hydropneumatic Brabham when they created the, you know, 1981 yeah. sort of cheaty Brabham that would sink and then rise up. Yeah. He had some ha had them just wire up a few random wires underneath, <laughs> make sure that people were taking lots of photos. And this is part. This is part of Formula well, One, and it wouldn't surprise me. It it's wouldn't the surprise me. About enough. The greatest book that's not been written is all the cheats in Formula One. One day we'll get it written, but I just don't know who's going to give us all the info. Um, thoughts on the race? Uh, I think I think you can't you can't undo or deny Max's brilliance. That sector three is the shortest sector of the lap, and the difference he made was outrageous. But it was almost a metaphor for, for his driving that those what probably less than a mile of track of, of track. He, he, he managed to pull three tenths out of everyone else on the circuit, which is outrageous and unheard of in that time. But he also managed to hit the barrier pretty much in a straight line yeah. and get away with it. And maybe we're seeing this. This, this always seems to be a, uh, a correlation between the drivers that are on a high that are just riding the crest and they have this luck. They have this Midas touch that when they do something that anyone else does, they get away with it. But everyone else gets punished. And Max just, he clattered quite a few things over the weekend. 
maybe he just knows. Maybe Ajim's told him this thing's a tank. You can whack it. You can brush the wall like mm-hmm. this, get away with it. Maybe he knows that. He, sometimes it does look like he's driving with that knowledge. Uh, but he's he's clearly got speed in that package that no one else has got. I thought Fernando was just utterly majestic. I thought Lewis deserves some credit. I thought I thought also Ocon was amazing. But the flip side is that that when when the rain came down in those cars, they're on slicks. I think everyone needs to to understand how difficult that is. You, yeah. It's just the driving position as well. You can't see anything. They can barely see their own mirrors. They can hardly see their own front wheels. They are sitting in the gizzards of those cars with so little visibility. I mean, for George Russell to have to reverse out of a, that escape road and rejoin the circuit, if I'd been reversing that thing, I'd have gone straight into the barrier. Yeah, I've seen you do that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think you need to keep your, your tools right inside your toolbox at the moment, Mr. C, because we've got a lot of fun on you. Um, also, you. Also, you weren't sailing this weekend. You were driving your motorboat. So let's not pretend that you're from Howard's way. So I just, <laughs> I, I just, I just think that they all deserve enormous credit. But as a spectacle, if you're relying on rain in the last 10 laps, you're a bit doomed in the future. The circuit is too small for the cars. Why can't it's given they read given they build this circuit, why can't they make it longer? I mean, there's lots of other roads in Monaco. Let's rejig the track, let's make it longer, let's have a DRS zone that works, let's allow them to try and overtake. Because that- did you like did you like the new camera angles? Because I think yeah. qualifying, part of the reason why qualifying was such a success was because you finally got an absolute sense yeah. of speed. That's a good, that's a good spot. I think, I think, Such I think, a big deal. But I thought some of the direction in the race was poor. because like, we missed. I agree, I agree, on, on I agree. Key bits of uh, of racing. But the Indy, God blimey. I mean, it's not for me, necessarily. But as a racing spectacle, I, I, I want to go and see that now. Yeah, I, I just do. Thought it was, I just thought it was raw. I thought it was, I thought it was good tempered. I thought it was sport. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, good tempered. I, it just can't I, not be. It had it's nineteen sixties Formula One, isn't it? I mean, yeah. they are so close. They are so in danger of throwing themselves into yeah. some. I love, I love the finish. I love Marcus Ericsson. I mean, I reckon he was turning pretty much as 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 sharply as a car at that speed can turn. He was putting as much angle into the steering as you could without making the car do something awful. Yeah, uh, I saw Catherine Leg fail to get out of the pits, and there was, there was everything. You know, there was you know she didn't even put it in the wall, in the pit lane. There was. It just yeah. had, it, it and was that Pulau weird. VJ crash in the pit. You know, we always see unsafe yeah. releases in Formula One and they just smash into each other. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah they'd be busy if they applied oh. the F- The stewards would be busy in Indy if they applied that principle. Did you also see uh, the, the tyre, the front, there was a, a front tyre that just sort of someone missed. He, he was taking a tyre yes, off. Right. Guy, he missed it, grabbed it behind him. It was well over the line. I mean, it's just... Yeah. But, if I make, but if I make, if I make a, a simple observation, it's that... It feels to me that Indy, despite the fact it doesn't have the global platform, is comfortable in itself in what it offers as a sport. I just got the feeling that when you tuned in to watch Indy, all it wanted to give you was racing drivers in cars doing their thing. When I tuned into F1, I got the sense that there was a sport that was trying to justify itself, that was trying to big itself up, and it had so much peripheral stuff going on. You know, I, I don't I don't really care about rap artists and everything else. I, I know that the, the sport wants that. But for me, that's just a sign that you're trying a bit harder to market yourself. Whereas if you, you know, if you if you're a great chef, you just hand over great food and people eat it and enjoy it. But if, if if you're a bit worried about what you're trying to serve, you probably give us every single thing written down on the menu as a description. Indy just seems a bit more comfortable with itself to me. That's my observation, and I'm very much a European racer, so it'd be interesting to see what happens. Do you uh, see the guy that Martin Brundle on his pit pit walk again, try, trying to get to Horner? Yeah, uh, and oh, what, God. <laughs> I'll, I'll oh, get fucking bollocked. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's almost like that was set up for me. Right, uh, I think we need a, we need a trip to Indy. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. God, blimey! Yeah. Uh, Gene Shepherd, trip to Indy. Get that story and read it. Now, yeah. the shortest time you've ever owned a car. Um, I'm not sure we can ask this to Edward Lovett because he's a motor trader um, with his glasses guide in his back pocket. Uh, so I'm going to ask this one to Chris Cooper. So uh, this is a bit embarrassing because we've talked about how much we love Alpina. Uh, and the shortest time I've owned a car was an Alpina. And it's it's a really nerdy, ir- irritating, embarrassing reason. It was a B E46, B3.3, about 20 years ago. 
Um, and I'd had a BMW 540 before that, which had loads of torque, had beautiful waftability. And I thought B3.3, it's going to be even sharper, really nice. And I, I was really disappointing straight after the 540. And the reason was in those Steptronic BMW boxes, if you move the gear lever just to the left, it automatically knocked it down a gear. So it gave you a little bit of instant extra torque by knocking it just to the left. The Alpina version of the Steptronic gearbox didn't do that. And irritatingly, when you did it, it sort of, when you knocked it to the left, it sort of went, it, the little thing on the dashboard just briefly flash up S, thinking, oh, it's gonna knock it down a gear, but it went straight to manual. So you had to knock it to the left and then use the buttons. So it just, for me, cause I'm really nerdy thought, doesn't quite work right. And I had a long conversation with the dealership, um, Sitners in, uh, would have been Gerard's Cross at the time before it went to High Wycombe. And I said, there must be a reason, there must be a way of fixing this. And they said, no. So because of the way the gearbox, when you knocked the lever to the left, didn't go down a gear, and just the way I used to drive the car, I thought, it's really irritating. I was reminded of this by, mm -hmm. Somebody who, because I mentioned Sittner and my um, B3 Touring, the single one that was sold in the UK, one of the Sittner guys got in touch with me and said, do you remember the previous one you had? And you had that really irritating fault you couldn't fix with the gearbox. I thought, oh, God, that's really great. So I owned it for about two weeks, three weeks. Oh. And I just couldn't live with that. Now I'm really, really regretting it because it was a lovely car. Uh, and I'd have one again in a flash. Now I know what I'm doing and I'm not such an idiot. But that shortest time I've ever owned a car was about three weeks because of the really irritating and nerdy view I had as to how I wanted the gearbox to work when you knocked it from the right to the left. Can I'm I just really stop, there, I stop you there for a second? Because actually, in 20 weeks of, of bearing our souls and how sad we are, that is a new depth. It's quite low. <laughs> I, 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 I have never heard anything like that in my life. I applaud you for sharing that with our audience. It's quite low. I'll give you the number of my therapist later on because that, that, that requires help. That I, I'm better now. I, I can you get back? Now. How much of your money do you get back when you go back with the car three weeks later? Do they say, nah, no? no. We've already answered that question. A, I, we're in a different time now. <laughs> I'm, not going to, I'm not going to answer that question because I've already embarrassed myself. Well, I've done the biggest depreciation about that one before. Right. It wasn't quite as bad. Neil Clifford. Neil Clifford's got his thousand yard stare on at the moment because he's deciding which one of his shit fights he <laughs> wants to tell us about. So Neil, over to you. <laughs> I'm referring to a new car purchase actually. I'm sure that the, I'm sure there's other stories that I can sort of dig out of the back of my head where I've hidden them under the bed. But the new car You're not a flipper, are you Neil? You're no, not a I'm flipper. Not, I'm not a flipper. I'm a very famous non-flipper, as you will know it. Um, but <laughs> I did uh, the Taycan. The Taycan. It was a really right brain versus left brain decision, the Taycan, because there was all the logic, all the left brain was telling me, oh, this is going to be great for your, <gasps> your daily commute and it's going to be free for the congestion charge and you can charge it at work and charge it at home. And wouldn't it be very sensible to get a take out and you'll save a lot of money? And the right brain was telling me, don't be a fucking idiot. Don't give up. <laughs> the, the one thing that you enjoy, which is the car with an engine, don't give up that because you don't really drink. You don't really do smoke. You don't do lots of other shit. You work and you drive cars and you have a family and a pretty boring chap. So anyway, my left brain won and it was the stupidest decision I've ever made. I had it for three, three and a half weeks, paid 105 grand for it. Actually, I was very sensible on the spec. I knew in a way I was doing the wrong thing. You know, when you're doing something. Yeah, that's the mistake. You know you'd like this is going to be wrong. Why are you buying this bloody thing? So I went silver. I did go full full chocolate leather, but I kept the the the, the spec. It was the four S, not the two. Yeah, that's a mistake. I didn't get out of control. Anyway, I then almost forced myself into a position of hating it. I think I almost did it subconsciously, deliberately. I thought oh, I'm going to go to Liverpool for the day on my son's birthday because I've got to visit this store. I've got to do work. There's no other car that I can take apart from the take and clearly there was. Yeah. And off I went and it was the biggest disaster. 
I was stuck in Liverpool. There were no charges. I then ended up in Cheshire, I think, at some shitty petrol station for three hours. I got home four hours late. I was in the shit at home. And I, 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 I sold it back, lost, I think, eight grand. Actually, the car would probably be worth more now than it was then. Not now. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, three and a half weeks, Porsche Taycan. Never let your left brain make decisions. That's the, that's the omen. <laughs> so, we've, so we've gone from sort of therapy to almost sort of Bible studies. I mean, that was almost like a parable, Neil. And I expect you to, <laughs> to talk about him half long hair or something afterwards. Now, here we go. Manish, uh, what's the shortest time you've owned a car? From, from what I've gathered, you've only ever owned about three. One. One. <laughs> oh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> So it's actually the longest I've owned it. Did you know all about this car? I was standing at yep. the station, as you know. Surrounded yeah. by... <laughs> I bought the car. He still can't. <laughs> not that <laughs> bloody car again. We can move. We can move to an advertising break now. <laughs> Judge, I tell you, the I, I I did have a bad night's sleep over this last night because the problem with this show is that actually you can only bullshit for a certain number of weeks, right? That's <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Susses who you really are, as opposed to you think you're coming across as, you know, all your facial tics, all your psychological. Anyway, the reason why I didn't sleep last night wasn't this question. What it was, was I was just wondering whether we'd have this again in about six months, where actually the question would be, how long did Manish keep his four, five, six? <laughs> <laughs> I am so nervous about this now. You're right, you're right to be. You're right to be. It's like the ultimate Venn diagrams of cars, and I can just see I do it. And suddenly go, no, no, no. He and should have bought on. an FF. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to Edward Lovett, okay? <laughs> then we're going to come back to you and ask you, I'm going to ask you a different question, maybe about tea or something. Now, <laughs> Edward Lovett, what's the shortest time uh, you've owned a car which you paid for with someone else's money? <laughs> um... So, I, well, I, obviously, I sell cars in an in instant, so not it doesn't take me very long to do it. When when I was when I went back when I was a car dealer, but I'll t I'll tell you a good story which I quite like. And actually, the guy I bought it off has recently passed away. So, and I'm pretty sure he hated me because I did this. But anyway, I was at Pebble Beach about five or six years ago, and um, on the Tuesday. Uh, in California, they do the concourse on the avenue where a lot of the um, pre um, the main concourse, there's some lovely cars parked there. Anyway, so I saw these guys in the street and as you do with car dealers, how are you? How's business? Nice weather, isn't it? Got anything interesting for sale? Bit of small talk. And they go, yeah, we just bought this little collection of cars. And so you get, they gave me a list of it and uh, a list of the cars they'd bought. And there were two cars on there that I quite liked. And I said, can I see some photos of them? And I said, well, let's go back to the hotel room. I'll show you the photos. So we did that, went back to the hotel room and uh, I agreed subject to seeing sounds them. Dodgy, to, sounds to, dodgy, to, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I agreed subject to seeing them after Pebble Beach um, that I would buy these two cars. So anyway, Pebble Beach goes, fly back to London and... I had to move house in London. So literally flew back, moved house, hopped on a plane, went to um, straight back to Boston 24 hours later, um, drove to see these two cars, one of which was a 250 PF coupe um, and uh, very happy with the car. And I had, I was flying, I stayed the night before and then I was flying back that evening so I thought, I think I'm sure there's a car dealer on the other side of Boston that I know. So I drove the other side of Boston, um, met this guy, lovely car dealer, Copley Motor Company. Is, yeah, is nice the car dealer. Nice advert. Stu, yeah. Stu, Stu Carpenter. Uh, how are you? Uh, nice weather. How's the market? How's business? Uh, what what got any cars for sale? I think he asked me this time. and goes, yeah, I've actually just bought a 250 PF Coupe. And anyway, 30 seconds later, I agreed to sell him the car. Didn't think anything of it. Flew back to London. And obviously, you know, these dealers didn't, they they never offered him the car in Boston. The two dealers on the other side of Boston, me, bloke from Swindon. And then I drove across town, sold, sold him the car. 
I don't think they ever forgave me for it. <laughs> I'm amazed by that. What I mean, how well, like, it was, it's just it's it sometimes with, with deals, it's about right time, right place. And I was yeah. in the right time and I was stood opposite them and they'd just been offered it. And I agreed to buy it there and then and you know, your words, your bond and all that, and got on, did the deal. Anyway, nice. that was uh, that's probably that was the best shortest time I've uh, I've owned a car for. And we're, there's a, we're not flippers here, so um, I've got so many stories of people that flip so cars. So there are other stories where you did flip it. No, no, no. I'm not. A, I'm a car no, dealer. No, so I'm no, out flipping flip cars but, at Silverstone. I think he's referring to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, oh, um, uh, Chris, just what one story you told me of? Who it, this was a Dick Lovett customer, and uh, this is a pretty well-to-do banker <laughs> in London, and he he said. And you, he called you and said, where, where am I? And goes, I'm, I'm, I'm on the way. I've sold the KN for 1,500 quid profit or something. This genius. I, I love this man. But he, he basically phoned me and he said, yeah, I'm just on my way down. I've just got Cayenne Diesel out of Bristol. Flipped it. And he'd made, and he'd made like four grand. He basically made what he'd make in 10 minutes and he'd been sitting at his desk in London. <laughs> but it was the middle of that era when everyone was just so addicted to being a car trader. That's when it all they love it. When everyone thought they'd become a motor trader. And they would and you this is the thing about this is the thing I love about this is the meritocracy of the of the of the marketplace is that if you're offered the chance to buy a car, no matter what someone tells you to do, what piece of paper you're told to sign, it's yours. You've bought it. You can do what you want with it. You can crush it. You can race it. Do what you want. But if you want to get, if you want to give it to the next man for a little tickle, you can do that as well. Just don't expect to get another one. And I think those stories. <laughs> I, I don't have any great stories about owning cars a short time necessarily. I know that I've been accused of flipping cars in the past. There's my my 992 GT3 Touring is currently for sale at some Porsche dealership. And I keep getting people forwarding me pictures of it with hashtag flipper. It's done seven and a half thousand miles. Half of them are sideways. I just don't understand. I just have, don't understand how that constitutes flipping. I thought flipping is when you leave something in the garage and don't use it. And then you, anyhow, I do think that I had a couple. Do, do, you, think it, do you think it's helping them that they're advertising it at 20 grand more than it's sold for in collecting cars? It's probably not helping them too much. Yeah, no, I thought, and my name on the V5 never helps. Uh, but I, I, I do think that um, I've had a couple. I had a Peugeot 106 xsi back in the day i had two of them the, the second one i i, I had one and thought it was not as good as a 205 xs i remember sticking with it because it looked cool and it was such a i had all the it had the sort of more sporty stuff on it the extended wheel arches and everything and i just thought it i it convinced myself it was great and it wasn't so i bought another one and i and i think i had it a day and i tried to sell it back to the same bloke and he didn't want anything to do with it so that was a that was a, an awful experience i think once you've once you've gone back Neil Clifford knows this. Once you've gone back, <laughs> you've convinced yourself there's going to be a different outcome that that could be applied to other areas of life. Um, you can, um, you, you, it's dreadfully disappointing when you think, mm -hmm. why have I done this? That is left brain versus right brain. You're right. But I think the most disappointing new car I've ever bought was that 997 Carrera 2 that I bought. It was a Carrera 2S. Talked about on here before. I don't think I owned it very long at all. I just think I bought the thing thought this is just not what I expected at all and got rid of it as soon as possible and took some huge amount of depreciation. I think I lost eight or ten thousand pounds in in a couple of months when I really couldn't afford to do so. Um but yeah those those I, I'm trying to think of a of a of an ownership experience that was short but positive. In other words, so how many people own a car but they have to get rid of it rather than they decide to get rid of it. Those are the stories we need to unearth. In fact, if you're in the comments section, please tell us those stories. Mm. I'm not saying any in this group, but just that shattering moment where you've got to get rid of something. You think it's landed. I love this. And then the school fees come in or the revenue wants some money off you or everything goes tits up or your business goes under. Those would be the shattering ones. I'm lucky I've not, I've not had one of those with a new car. I've had it with old cars. Um, okay, <laughs> now, this is, a, this is a random one. I've asked each of our contributors to regurgitate their favourite motoring phrase and what it means to them. I've got a couple. I'm going to start off this one, OK, because I'm still talking. I've got two. You can start it. You might be finishing it as well. I oh, know. Well, <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got two. The first was, I think, the first time I heard Martin Brundle use the phrase, 
mobile chicane to describe a back marker. I'd never heard it before, but I think in terms of phrases that, that just describe something in a way that you never thought of talking about it, it was such a perfect and remains a phrase that I think so many people have adopted, but he was the first person to do it. I don't think so. Do you know, I think it was actually Alan Jones describing the 1981 Ferrari. I think it was so? him. Yeah, I think so. I think he said that we, we had to go past the mobile chicane. Ah, you're right. You're I think right. it was Jonesy. Actually. Well, I've never heard it in a, in a commentator capacity, so I'm going to give it to Martin because he was brave enough to say it from the comms box. I, I love that. Um, and I've got another one for you, which is my late dear mother. This describes how different we are, how differently we react to fast moving cars now. I think that if you're going quite quickly on a, on a motorway or an A road now and something comes past you, people tend to react in a negative fashion. There's this absurd sense that even though you're probably breaking the speed limit yourself, you have the moral superiority because that person's <laughs> going even faster. That you become, you become the arbiter of what sensible speed is because you appointed yourself as some kind of justice system, which is fucking absurd, let's face it. Sorry, pound in the box for Chris Cooper. Anyhow, I, I, I love the fact that now in the old days, my mother would be tanking along and we'd get something would come screaming past, normally a bike, and she'd go, he's going well. And I, just <laughs> love, I just love that phrase. And, I, and I, I try to say it myself now with the kids in the car. If something comes past me, it's rare, but they do now and again, I always go, he's going well or she's going well. <laughs> yeah, I just think nice. it's a nice way of approaching the subject. And the reason why... Um, it means something to me, as my old dear used to say it. There we go. I'm, I'm now probably, that was very much designed for me, that question. I wonder if the rest of you managed to find anything else in it. Neil Clifford. I did. And I don't know whether this is really a motoring phrase, but anyway. I spent a lot of money on booze, women and fast cars. The rest I just squandered. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this, this is officially my man crush, which is George Best. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. The, the best, the best British footballer of all time. For me, the most beautiful man of all time. If 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 your um, man crush, Chris, is Toto, mine is George Best, without doubt. Um, amazing movies to watch about him, but you know, the most talented guy. I had the kit. I had the football boots. I even did the celebration. You know, I'm a man of the 70s and um, he scored with left foot, right foot, the head. He won the European Championship for Man United. I am a red. I inherited that from my brother. Um, but you know, and then he had Jags, didn't he? If you Google him, he had E-types. He had um, Mark 1 Jags. He had Astins. He had Lotus. You know, he had a couple of cool Lotuses. But I think actually I reflected on it and, and tried to be a little bit sort of grown up and sensible just for one minute. He is telling us, he's telling us a lot, I think, with that statement, because he's telling us to go and fucking enjoy life. You know, it, it, it isn't a drill. We're, 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 it's not a rehearsal, you know. Um, laugh a lot. Do as much as you can. You know, COVID... COVID really was shit for us all, wasn't it? It was certainly shit for me from a business perspective, work perspective. I spent six months on the sofa, you know, getting up at one in the morning. Um, and I think post-COVID, I really made a determined, clear decision to have a bit more joy, have a bit more fun. Um, I think it interrupted our rhythms badly, but I think make a firm decision to have more pleasure, meet new people, travel more, see the world, do stupid shit. I think that whole reference of um, don't grow up, you know, it's a trap, I think is dead right. Don't stop learning. The most important thing for me post-COVID is maintain curiosity, right? Our mental health, I'm going really deep now, but our mental health, you know, it's a good thing we talk about mental health now because just because you've got loads of flash cars and you've got a nice house, you haven't got a mortgage, it doesn't really fucking matter at the end of the day. You can still be sort of super low. And I think out of COVID, I decided to really get going. Be curious. Pretend you're still 12 years old. I think it's a big lesson. And that's what George was telling us. Don't grow up. So that's my little, uh, that's my little rant for the day. Curiosity. Also, get, Curiosity. Invited, get invited. 
get invited onto a random podcast. Well, you know what? I was thinking that, Chris. I would have 100% said no, right? If Ed Ed would have asked me pre-COVID, oh, I can't do that. I'm too busy. I've got this big job. I don't want to mix, you know, chips with pasta. I don't want to mix up. I don't want to expose, you know, I don't want to look a bit of an idiot on a podcast. I can't do that. I'm going to be sensible. What are people going to think? You know what? Fuck it. <laughs> right? Enjoy yourself. Because at some point you're going to be in a wheelchair pissing in your trousers. <laughs> right? And it's not going to be that long. So I think be curious and meet new people and get yourself out of your comfort zone as much as possible. And that's my reflection of me doing this podcast in a way. And we should all go out there and pretend we're 12. That's what George was telling me. Can I have your speedster when you're pissing in your trousers? You can, yeah. It's 500 grand. Cheers, (laughs) thanks. 500 (laughs) grand. Well, Edward, I tell you what, Edward, he's, he's undone you there because he's saying go out and be 12. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you've never grown up beyond 12. So what are your no. favourite words? Well, I, do you know, I, I wrote some down and I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything smart, Chris, but listening to your story, it's just reminded me of one. And my godfather was Tom Walkingshaw. And I... Was he? Well, wow. He, yeah, and, and to, Tom, Tom owned Gloucester Rugby Club. Rugby Club. And his funeral uh, was at in Gloucester, and Martin Brundle was there, and he stood up and did uh, an a new eulogy, and he and I'm going to butcher this a bit, but I'll I'll do my best. But he was telling a story of when they were racing at Bathurst, and Martin said, "I've n- I've never raced here uh, before, Tom. You know what were, they were? So they were both in, in TWR Jaguars, and uh, and Martin said, I, 'I've never raced here. You know, do, you know what, what, what? How do how do we do this?' And Tom was, when the when the cat wags its tail, just follow it, and, <laughs> and it just it just resonated with me, <laughs> and I." And there we go. There's one. It, it came. It came to me from yours, Chris. But uh, I, I had some other ones written down. But that's better than all of them. Tom Tom Walkinshaw's cheat stories. That's that's half that book. That yeah. is half that book. Yeah. Uh, Manish, you've probably got a few words that you can mention here. Yeah, you know, I'm um, listening to Neil. I want to actually just change something I've written. Um, Stella was always regarded as a little bit, um, you know, maybe a little bit dour, especially by. The British media. Um, but like Brazilians, he had a lot of difficulty with consonants. You know, they all speak very nasally, they don't hit hard T's and D's. And there was a when he really felt he'd done something very well. I always remember this phrase he had. My friend Max from school and I always used it to describe when something went incredibly right, whether it was an exam or a girl or a party, we'd say, tremendios fantas. And that's what he would say. He couldn't say tremendously fantastic, which is just wonderful. You know, two super tremendous fantas. <laughs> tremendous fantas. This Grand Prix is tremendous fantas. The overtaking of you is tremendous fantas. That's so lovely. I just love that. It's so wow. positive. So Edward, Edward, that is our first T-shirt for this podcast, all right? That is our first T-shirt. It is, is it? Tremendous fantas. fantas. We're going into the swag business. Tremendous fantas. Love it. Right. Uh, Chris Cooper. So places to be. So whenever I, so I, monkey's right. Whenever occasionally people do get past me on the public highway and I'm very gracious about it. Um, and both my, Finn and Cameron both said on occasion when somebody's gone, Harry flatters past us. Another great expression. <laughs> I was trying to discover the etymology of Harry flatters this morning and mm. it's quite it's quite opaque but when something goes harry flatters past you rather than chase him dad which i never need encouragement for they'll say places to be he's got places to be she's got places to be uh which i think is a great british understatement for hmm he's yeah. going well yeah, oh, yeah I kind of, I'm, they're a bit they're a bit with your mum well. on that one monkey um but my kind of i thought about Sorry, everybody else. Um, I thought about one of my favorite phrases for a long time was it's funnier in the front. 
And I thought oh, that's just no. and and that's just going to mean something to Monkey from all of our trips. When the three of us used to drive to Germany, and Guy Spur, now a coffee merchant and and roaster in Sussex, I spoke to you last week. Cast, and reminded me about cast this. Iron, cast Iron Roasters is a plug for his business. Go and look at yeah. some coffee; it's fantastic. And it is very good. It's a great man. He said he said you must find a way somehow of, of wheedling in. It's funnier in the front. Because the three of us just travel together and Monkey would always sit in the back and he would always try and claim it's funny. And we said, no, it's always funny in the front. Um, but the one I kind of like most is give it the berries, <laughs> which is um, you could probably guess it could only have come from Nigel Mansell. Oh. And he would occasionally, I really, Nigel was a hero of mine. I was, I guess, because he's British and because he never, he never looked like anybody's idea, really, of a racing dog. He didn't look like a sort of a raifish Graham Hill or the, the people that came before him. Nor was he, didn't he, and he was the antithesis of Nelson Piquet. But it's really funny you say that. I think he looks like a fighter pilot. He looks like a fighter pilot. World War II. I could Im- yeah. yeah, I could imagine him in his greens. He's got the moustache, even the flag. He just looks, he has a kind of coolness about him. And I, I think he's got that. Cool, he's, but... he's got that. And uh, just that wonderfully, because he, he, let's face it, he was, he was known and he is known for um, how he'd react to some of his crashes and sort of rather overdoing, oh, it's, it was really painful, Murray, and so forth. <laughs> but this sort of wonderfully understated give it the berries. In other words, just give it all the throttle and just give it death. And there were times when, and Patrick Head would always say about him, when he was in the car, you knew that's how fast that car would go. He simply couldn't help himself. He just had to drive it. And that fantastic 92 car where he qualified at Silverstone in the 92 British Grand Prix, 1.7, 1.8 seconds on pole from Patrese, who was quite a good peddler. But Patrese just didn't have the nerve or the berries mm-hmm. to do that high-speed turning where on that active ride, the car just had a little bit of a shimmy, and Nigel just said, we're going for it. So give it the berries. Sums up my hero, Nigel, really well. Love it. Right, now we're moving on to um, our two-car garage for the week, which is set by <laughs> and is therefore absolutely absurd. Here we go. <laughs> and I can't believe I'm reading this. So just imagine <laughs> this name. You are a wealthy Arab sheikh. I wish. Spending time between the Middle East and London. It's a funny old time since the oil crisis. You are wealthier than ever, but not perhaps as popular as you once were, as Britain is enduring a pretty nasty recession. So your London car is all about being seen as serious and sensitive, brackets, while still maintaining a certain level of decorum befitting your status dash, i.e. you can't be seen in a 2CV. I'll take issue with that later on, Manish. <laughs> Whilst at home, you're going to burn it in whatever you want. Manish, answer your own question first, please. Chris, you, you I think you missed, you, you missed the start of it. It's 1977. 1977, sorry. That's oh, quite important. 1977. Yeah. Yeah, now, now you've offended everyone because you didn't put that one in at the start. <laughs> well, it's 1977, and you've got that. 77, 77, rich Arab between Middle East and London, sensible town car, fancy one back at home. Let's go. Manish. And so I, we've talked about this car in the context of the police, but I think he's going to get himself a Rover 3500 SD1 with a chauffeur in the front. I think lots and lots of cloth. I think this is going to be navy blue i think you're not going to see it he's going to have a chauffeur and the chauffeur's going to be did do you remember that show butterflies yes yes oh lovely wendy craig exactly wendy craig who who was the guy who was desperately in love with her and had a ford granada with a chauffeur wow that's good yeah no that's true i don't know because that was the point you know she was desperately desperately she was this kind of fun she was married to jeffrey what's his name i'm on the google Google. I think he was one of my uncles. <laughs> but it, it, actually, it had one of the uh, best visual uncle. jokes. <laughs> Meet your new uncle. It had the, I just remember it had the best visual joke I've ever seen because um, 
Nicholas Lindhurst was one of her kids. I he remember. was a weedy one, yeah. Yes, and there was a running joke that she couldn't cook. So she has a go at frying some onions, and he lifts this up, and he says, Mum, your cooking looks like some form of contraceptive. It's just <laughs> this onion ring, which has been deep fried. Oh, so she, she was lovely. Oh, Rhea, Rhea. Mm. Rhea. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Okay. But I imagined that it was a toss-up between a Granada with a chauffeur and the Rover SD1. And I did a little bit of looking. And do you know, there's the, the promotional film for the Rover 3500 was actually made by Raymond Baxter. It's 10 minutes long. The okay? God. And Sir he talks Raymond about Baxter. David Bash, the guy who designed it, yeah. who looks like the, 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 the lollipop guy from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I mean, a really sinister-looking German. Well, the show um, catcher. The, car, the child catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Have you seen Raymond? Have a look at David Bash. Check him out. Scary looking dude. Given, so, given, um, given and, recent news events, let's steer clear of uh, child catching, please. Okay. Yes, they were. Thank you. But, but it's got this lovely section, which almost Ridley Scott could have shot. Okay, so you've got the Rover 3500. It's driving through the French countryside to Stevie Wonders. Isn't she lovely? Oh, I can't oh. believe we haven't seen that. It's, it's fantastic. So that's his main car. And then I think... I think back in the Middle East. You see, this guy, I think, doing a kneel, was sent to the Rosie in Stad for his schooling, a school which today costs 50,000 quid a term. Okay, so this is a very elite school. He spent lots and lots of time in Switzerland. He speaks beautiful French, reasonably good German, perfect English, and of course, six Arab dialects. He's a very refined man. And I think in 1977, his head was turned by a Monteverdi 375 SL high speed. Oh, lovely. Little Cooper at the back. Mm. Seven litre engine, Fisore, Carrozzeria Fisore, although I think it was uh, Bruo designed it. And um, this thing I found out was 79,200 Swiss francs in 1977. £20,000. It was more expensive than a Berlinetta boxer at the time. And that is going to be his car at home. I like You've it. been working on this for weeks. Uh, also, <laughs> can we agree that Monteverdi is in the top five greatest sounding yeah. car names ever? Yeah, Monteverdi. I'm going to come back to that. Whenever you race against Carlos at, a, at an old race meeting, you look at his name on the timesheets and just go, you should win. Just give yeah. you the win. Your name's too cool. Right. Uh, Neil Clifford. Right. The obvious call is... He got his top trucks now. <laughs> and by the way, if you're a, 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 a refined gentleman of the Middle East in 1977 in London, you do not leave the square that goes from Harrods to Sloan Square, Eaton Square, Buckingham Palace, Regent Street... You're only in Kensington or Mayfair. So there's no exposure to any fucking recession whatsoever, right? You're staying in the Dorchester. You know, you're at the Playboy Club. You're, you're in Curzon Street casinos. You are having fun. Your family has been poor for 4,000 years. You are not getting involved in any recessions. <laughs> so you're ignoring any element of being subtle. You're going to buy a Rolls Royce Camargue. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm man. just ignoring the challenge. He's done, he's done you there, man. He's taken your historical context and yeah. he's stuffed it right where the sun don't shine. <laughs> that, that's the that's the Tuesday ten o'clock fire alarm. Um, so you're going to buy a Rolls Royce Camargue. If anything says I am wealthier than you in 1977, it's a Rolls Royce Camargue. Pinaferina, beautiful thing, actually. Yeah. I don't know what. He's probably going gold with the chocolate. And he's just smoking around with a cigar um, in uh, a Camargue. What is he going to do back in um, Riyadh? Well, actually, he's getting a Monteverdi. Mm. Monteverdi is the thing. And it's a Monteverdi High yeah. 50S. I oh, <laughs> It's the one. It's the one we've never seen. You can yeah. almost, you can almost not even see it on YouTube. This thing is so rare. 
but your seven litre, it won everything in top trumps, actually. It did. It was, it was the car. It was, you know, there was the Countach, there was the Boxster, there was the Daytona, there was the 250 short wheelbase. There was the weird sort of three, five, sixes with the strange children photographs. But the Monteverdi 450S high was the car. That's what it had. It had the two best cars out of top trumps. S right. or an SS? Or S. 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 Right, Chris Cooper's making a note of that. He can now give us his two-car garage. So um, I've given this a bit of thought. Oh, 1977. God. Interesting year. Uh, stagflation rather than inflation. It was kind of the end of the post-war Keynesian economics phenomenon. So big similar to what we've got right now. So there was persistent high inflation. Inflation in 77, 15.8%. Fourth year in a row, inflation had been in double figures, but there was growth. Small, 2.5% GDP growth in 77, a bit more in 78, but it was getting towards the end of that point where post-war Keynesian economics, which was government intervention sooner rather than markets. So the point about this is, people are interested in this stuff, Chris. The point about this is... You podcast about cars, don't you? <laughs> so the point there's a point to this. The point about this is it was this it was the end of one era going to another era. Ah. So Ford Fiesta was launched in 1977. It was the M5 was launched, the motorway that is not the car. Mm. Um, first commercial Concorde flight that was a big master in 77, massive, apart from the Queen's massive. Jubilee. Um, Early was on that by the way, the Air France one. The first one, that, that, that one that had the dual takeoff, one to Bahrain, one to wherever it went to, Rio. So it went, it? it went to Rio. So you yeah. flew from Paris to somewhere yeah. in West Africa, I think Senegal, and then Senegal to Rio. <laughs> um, and it was that kind of a Virginia Wade one, Wimbledon, uh, best-selling single that year was Mullican Turbine Wings. Blah, this blah, is blah, a blah. galactic-style digression. I'm loving it. Carry on. Yeah. Um, the Chain, Fleetwood Mac. That still started going. As you're whole, still going. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, still going. Um, so, and OPEC was probably in its heyday. So OPEC was set up in 1960, uh, and it was a response from the Middle East, our Sheikh's family included, to the Seven <laughs> Sisters. The Seven Sisters were the big US oil companies. So OPEC was set in 1960, but its heyday was between the Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur War of 73, the oil crisis, and the Iranian Revolution in 78, which precipitated another oil crisis. So 77 was kind of their heyday. If you look at the history of OPEC, it was absolutely, that was his heyday. So that's another way of saying, Neil is right, Manish. This guy would not be being bashful because this was OPEC's heyday. So his London car- We've just gone through musical choices, post-Keynesian economics, tectonic plates shifting politically, and the top 10. And, and all of that is just to say this guy doesn't give a shit. We asked, you, also, to name, we asked you to name two cars, and you've come <laughs> up with the words Yom Kippur. Yeah, that's it. That's why people love this stuff. <laughs> so the first car would be, I think, because there's been a little bit of subtlety, but hey, this guy knows this stuff. Maserati Kyle Army. Oh, oh yes. Oh. Just yeah. love that. I'd have one now. I, in fact, I'm going to go and find one now. Just buy one. Beautiful. Buy one for Manish. Such <laughs> an elegant, such an elegant two-door, three-box shape, four-seater, big V8 engine. Gorgeous. Um, I had Monteverdi High 450 on my list, but because I never just have one, I also had, if he's just going to go mad in 1977 at home, he'd have a Panther 6. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. Okay. Panther six. It gets so, a second mention. It has to. Yeah. That's my. Okay. That's what. That. That's the context. Some political considerations. <laughs> social change. Maserati Kyle Army Panther six. It's like you're you, you're a you're a mobile textbook of information, and we love it. We're very grateful for it because it also gives us a chance just to nod off whilst you're talking and just regroup. Now then, um, I'm going to speak next, just in case Edward Lover's got the same choices as me, which I think <laughs> he might. Um, so I'm going for the London car. I, I've adhered to what Manish has asked me to choose from because I don't have any idea of the socio-economic times that we're dealing with because I was only two at the time and I, I didn't. OPEC, I thought, was an ice lolly. I have no idea about any of it. So I'm going to say that if I'm going to drive around London and be subtle but actually have a bit of fun, 
I've gone for a 450 SEL 6.9, but it's had the badges taken off it to be a 280. Nice. Well, I think that's a nice way around it. So I've got a set, basically a 6.9 litre V8 that could do 150 miles an hour, but it's badged a 280. And I've had a locking diff put in it. And, I'm, and therefore I can smoke around every, every 90 degree turn in London and be an absolute ass. My Riyadh car is a little bit more spectacular because I've got a special relationship with Maranello that you don't know about. So I've gone there and I've said to the commendatory, I've said, look, I've had a Daytona, but it's not enough. I want a comp. I want a Daytona comp with number plates. So he's done me a comp, best of all, because he knows me too well. He's had the passenger seat taken out of it and he's had a little um, bed put in for my pet cheetah. So I've got oh, a thank you for that. I've got, <laughs> I'm in, in 77 in Riyadh, I'm going to have a pet cheetah. You are, 100%. I, I, I sleep with this cheetah every night. So I've got, <laughs> I've got a Daytona comp for the road with number plates with a cheetah seat in it. Okay. Yes, Ed would love it. You go. That is genius. <laughs> Ed would love it. Well, I'm dear friends with the. Uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I called him to tell him about my dilemma and he said, fuck him. <laughs> Don't worry. I build you a pair of cars. Exactly. I build you an LP400 Periscopio and I build you an Espada. And we do them in the same colour. Oro Metallizzato Lanchon. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you've you've absolutely smashed it. And also, historically, none of us knew that Ferruccio came from Bangladesh. I did not know his accent, you mean. <laughs> Look at that. Look yeah. at it. Oh my yeah. days. Yeah. That's fun. Okay. Yeah. I think we've, we've nailed those. Now look, yeah. people. I'm going to, there was one other thing on the list, but I'm actually going to have to, I'm going to have to say no to it this week because we, we've we done well over an hour and I'm afraid, I might have mentioned this before, I'm writing a fucking book and it's not going very quickly at the moment. So I'm going to have to go off and do a bit of book writing. Uh, I think we've had a good discussion this week. So I'd like to move on, please, to some music. So Neil Clifford, can you give us a piece of music? And I know that you're in a reflective mood, so this could be quite heartfelt. Oh, yeah, no, I'm in a deep, I'm in a deep, and maybe it's the bank holiday that's maybe all reflective and soft and squidgy. I'm staying in the, I'm staying in Britpop. I'm staying in the 90s. You mentioned it last week, Chris, and I thought, fuck yes, that's, a, you know, I've done my Oasis. I'm sure I will do a blur, but I'm going to go Verve. You know, um, they were probably my second. I put them ahead of Blur, really, Pulp in fourth. I would, the, um, I got married on September the 11th. Now, obviously, that's not a very good day for an anniversary, really. But I did get married in 1999. So it was sort of before the September 11th thing became famous. Um, but it was my first dance song, or whatever you call it, with my wife, Lucky Man. And, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's an emotional song for me and my wife. Fortunately, I still am with my wife, which is sort of lucky, lucky for me, frankly. But it's a brilliant song. It's all about the fact, if you study the lyrics, it's all about the fact of after the peacock moment when you're showing off as a, as a, as a bloke and you've, you know, you've impressed her and you've taken her to the right restaurants and you've shown her your best shoes or whatever you've done, that moment after that, when it becomes just normal and you can't have an act anymore, you've got to be normal. I travelled the world with my wife for two years and you can't hide shit in two years in a camper van. So um, Lucky Man is, uh, is my choice of song today and it is brilliant. That album is just... Oh, awesome. it's a brilliant album. I know, Very I know good. You can say Oasis was a better band, but I think if you looked at the best four songs on the best albums of all time made by British artists... I think Urban Hymn might be, might be might be the best of those because I, I think Elton John even said, "I wish I would have written Lucky Man by The Verve." It's that good. Sonnet, yeah. drugs don't work. Drugs don't work. The whole album, like a cat, like a cat in a bag waiting to drown. Whenever yeah. I hear that, I go, "Oh my god!" Yeah. Okay, sorry, I digress. Manish, um, I'm going to go back to the 70s, 1976. Jean-Michel Jarre released the album Oxygen. Oh, and if you remember, wow. Oxygen 4 was yeah. the big hit. So uh, imagine that in your car. I listened to it last night. It absolutely stands up. 
And John Michel Jean, very good looking. Remember the big long hair? Mm-hmm. He was married to mm-hmm. Charlotte Rampling. I just had this awful moment when I turned it on and watched this video. He looked a lot like Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. That was <laughs> that was the only sad moment. I sort of looked at it. Oh no. Oh no. But he was uh, much more talented. Dude. Much more talented. You'll be saying Mozart looked like Noel Edmonds next week. Chris Cooper. <laughs> So I was just trying to find now, because I saw it in the comments from last week's episode. I know you tell us not to read the comments, but obviously all of us read all of them. Um, it reminded me that we haven't said, and nobody said uh, Don Henley, uh, Summer, uh, yeah, that one. Um, Summer. Yeah. So um, that's what I think is just such an uplifting, soaring, yeah, brilliant. Your lovely song. Uh, Edward Lovett. I, I delved into a Spotify black hole this morning, <laughs> trying to deal with jet jet lag as I'm here oh. somewhere. Oh, there he is. There he is. Is that Bristol? That's Bristol. Uh, yeah. That, that yeah. is actually yeah. That's the central Bristol overlooking Henleys. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So yeah, fighting a bit of jet lag this morning, and um, for some reason, at four o'clock this morning, I, I found myself in in sort of trance nation, trying to find things that I listened to in the, in a in the car as a as a young man, and uh, I didn't think trance was really what we'd want to be listening to here. So I found Robert Miles' "Children," um, and I listened to it, and that's that's my choice for today. It's quite good. I, I had some other rather bizarre ones, but uh, yeah, that's my choice. I'm oh, writing that down now. Fucking tune. Slightly dangerous given the times we're in, but I'll I'll go with yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> a lot. Of shall, shall I edit it for another one? A lot one. of references <laughs> to a particular daytime TV show today. Um, right. <laughs> um, I um, and this is a group that we've not mentioned yet, and it's easy to hate them, and it's very easy to hate the lead singer. But I was, um, I don't actually, I, I don't agree with either of those positions. But I, I was listening, to, I was watching something on uh, Instagram when you scroll through endlessly, and you'd keep, you say, I'm not going to look at the next one, and it keeps going, it keeps going, and you've lost 20 minutes of your life, and you can <laughs> about it. At least. And there was a live version of uh, uh, the U2's Where the Streets Have No Name. And I just oh, think that, cool. that soaring guitar intro is pretty special. I know it's, yeah. you know, I know it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's quite a tune, and I defy anyone to put it on today. Oh, it's amazing. Have a bit of a heart-melty moment. And it also allows you then to go back to the Alan Partridge episode where he pretends to his girlfriend that he knows Bono, and he goes to a tea shop in a stately home in Norwich and gets his mate to dress up as the Edge. <laughs> uh, uh, and it is absolutely fine. It's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? No, he gets to dress up as Bono, isn't he? He says, it's as Bono, yeah. Is the edge, the edge is fine. Uh, so you can, you can, you can laugh at that as well. But no, I think that YouTube tune is fantastic. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. I've got one other piece of housekeeping for you. A couple of weeks ago, uh, one of my favourite writers passed away. Not many people know who he was. It wasn't Martin Amos. It was a guy that wrote a column in The Spectator. This is apolitical. I don't really, I don't like any politicians left or right. Just so happens this guy was a great writer. He was called Jeremy Clark. All right, and I, 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 I implore any of you to try and get hold of this book. This was the best column written in English language for the last twenty years. It's irreverent. It's funny. It's naughty. It's sad. It's really, really brilliant. And um, and this podcast should serve to surface the things in our lives that we think are joyous that we want to share with you. That's the whole point of it. And that's one from me, Jeremy Clark. Go and read his columns because they are just spectacular. From Edward Lovett in Hong Kong, from Chris Cooper in King's Inn, from Manish Pandey in Central London, and from Neil Clifford, fuck knows where he is, and from London, me in Bristol. London. London, London. From me in Bristol, uh, have a lovely, lovely week. Enjoy the sunshine. And I'm off to the Isle of Man TT in about five hours' time. Bye-bye.